Welcome to the Style Blues Podcast. This is where we talk about sewing a beautiful wardrobe and creating a beautiful home. If you have style blues, we can fix it. Your host is Jessica Kramer, apparel designer and blogger at chambrayblues.com. Listen in and let your blues disappear. Hear ye, hear ye, calling all lords and ladies of the fair. Gather around for this fascinating tale of adventure. If you're at all interested in cosplay, steampunk, or historical costumes, this episode is for you. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be back again. And today we're going to talk about sewing costumes for the Renaissance Fair. It's one of my all-time favorite things to do. I have been attending Renaissance Fairs for more than 25 years. It's a huge event and many people love and enjoy it. I was at the bank recently opening a new bank account when I had an interesting conversation with the banker. I was telling him about my blogging business and he was asking me a lot of questions. And then he went on to tell me that he spends his weekends doing steampunk events and has this passion for historical costumes. And it was so unexpected. He's a very conservative gentleman with a bow tie and very neatly trimmed beard, you know, very proper sort of businessman. And here he has this kind of secret life on the weekend uh, where he becomes someone totally else. And I someone else. And I think that's the draw of this type of event is that it gives us a chance to step out and be someone that we normally wouldn't during our nine to five hours. So who who would have guessed that you would run into someone like that? And I'm sure that there's lots more stories like that out there. I myself love to put on costumes and go to the fair. And it's been something we've been doing as a family for a long time. So first of all, maybe you're not familiar with it, but what is the Renaissance Fair? Uh, When we were first married about 28 years ago, a friend of mine suggested that we attend the local fair here in Bristol, Wisconsin. The fair is a theatrical type of event with people wearing historically accurate costumes, lots of music from the period, games, food, Anything that's part of the Renaissance period, which was from 1450 to 1650, is part of this festival. So they have a little bit of mystic stuff. They have fortune telling. They have weapons and along with different types of entertainment. It's usually an outside event. Here in Wisconsin, it's in this giant field with period buildings, tents, storefronts, uh, even a jousting arena and makeshift um, type of theaters. The fair is open during the summer each weekend for about two months. Uh, Professional actors are in costume as members of the fair, and they help set the stage for your experience at the event. So when you go to the fair, don't be afraid to engage with them. It makes the whole experience so much fun. Uh, For example, you'll learn very quickly what a privy is, and some other terms from the time that it just makes it so fun to engage in it all. So there are a number of large fairs worldwide. Um, In the U.S., there are four major fairs, the one here in Bristol, Wisconsin. There's one in Tuxedo, New York. There's one in Pasadena, California, and one in Shakopee, Minnesota. So I've been to all of the fairs except for the one in California. Each fair is a little bit different and you'll find that it's fun to travel and see what the other fairs are like. They are addictive, I'm telling you now. Uh, for those who love costumes and want to become someone else for a day. So the big question is, do you have to wear a costume? And the answer is no. However, you will have so much more time if you do go in costume. And as a creative person, you'll find so much to inspire you. To, you'll want to sew even more for the, the next time that you go to the fair. But before you begin your costume, you will want to decide what sort of character you want to be. So if you study history of the time, which is a great thing to do with your kids, by the way, we did it as part of our homeschooling, you'll find that there's a distinct difference in social classes that determines what sort of clothing you would wear during that time period. So the peasant class is generally 
poor people with little or no money to spend. Clothing was very simple. No prints or patterns other than an occasional tartan. No fancy buttons, trims, or elastics. Clothes were made from light to midweight woven cotton, linen, gauze, wool, and burlap. Unfinished types of leather are is okay, such as shearling or suede. Colors that were popular include off-white, beige, light blue, dark blue, orange red, russet, light browns, and gray. So that's the peasant class. So the high social classes would include members of the nobility, judges, gentlemen, and people of wealth. So their clothing would have been more lavish, including textured or embroidered pieces, delicate laces and trims, silver or gold buttons, and fine leather. Prints were lavish brocades, damask, finely woven linens, velvets, taffeta, silks, and satin. Colors would include shades of purple, red, black, white, dark brown, or green. So each color that was worn during this time period symbolized something about the social status of the person who was wearing it. For example, light blue was worn by marriageable young women, green by youths, yellow by prostitutes, etc. You can read more about color symbolism with the fair, and I'll have all of this in my notes for today's episode. It's kind of a lot to remember all at one time. But what should you wear? So let's start with that. Let's talk a little bit about maybe what you don't want to wear. So you don't want to wear tennis shoes or modern apparel or athletic gear, high heels, graphic t-shirts, blue jeans, baseball caps, and definitely not heavier winter type clothing because no matter what day I attend the fair, it's always the hottest day of the year. So things that you can sew for the event. There's a lot that you can make and they're not difficult sewing. There are some pieces that can be more challenging. We're going to talk about that. So what type of class you choose determines what sort of costume you'll make, but here are some ideas. So let's start with the ladies. So ladies, you'll want to look at wearing a long full skirt, a cotton chemise or underdress or blouse, a corset, maybe carrying a satchel would be a simple drawstring purse, a snood, which is a net that's worn over long hair, crescent shaped headpiece or veil, a cape or a wrap, Blouse with ties on the front with leg of mutton sleeves. Skinny pants or leggings with long boots and a big blouse would work. Kind of a pirate type of costume. Loose fitting hat or bonnet would also work for hair coverings. For the men, you can look at sewing a loose billowy undershirt with an open neck and big sleeves. A doublet or a vest in leather or faux leather. A jerkin or loose fitting top over the undershirt. Loose-fitting pants or cropped pants, leather breeches, even a tartan sash and a kilt would work, a cape, a flamboyant-style cap, a garment with fur trim, or pumpkin hose, which are those balloonish-style breeches that cover up the upper thighs. So let's talk a bit about sewing and constructing some of these things. So garments during this time, of course, would have been made completely by hand. Fortunately, due to the popularity of this type of event, there are great historical patterns available from Simplicity, McCall's. I had chosen a Simplicity Renaissance costume collection pattern that I made that had both a peasant class design and a high class one, which was Kind of nice. I made one of the costumes. I'm planning on making the other one soon. As far as finding fabric, it's pretty easy to find plain cottons or linens. Looking for brocades and fancier types of fabrics can be a little bit more challenging, but the home decor department has oodles of them. And that's a great place to find bits and pieces for your costume. They're heavier, they're more high quality patterns and they work great for costumes. So the corset that I have is made from a gold brocade and is perfect for this period. And that fabric came from the home decor department. So when sewing, here are some tips. Stick with a simple straight stitch or a zigzag. 
You don't have to sew it by hand. You can machine sew. After all, it is a costume. No one expects you to do it all by hand. I wouldn't bother serging the seam allowances in the costume unless you plan on wearing it regularly. If you're only going to wear it a couple times a year, it doesn't really make sense to finish all those seams. And a lot of these fabrics are dry cleanable. So make sure and check your label when you purchase them so you know how to launder it. If you wash a gold brocade, for example, it'll never be the same. So be aware of what the care requirements are when you purchase something. So let's talk a little bit about the corset. So as for the women's costumes, of course, it's probably the most intimidating thing to sew. Most of the other pieces are very simple with straight stitches, as I mentioned. And corsets aren't as hard to make as you think. The corset is the foundation garment that's worn over the chemise to support the bust and shape the waist. You will not want to wear a bra under this garment, although you may be tempted to do so. Trust me, it's very tempting. (laughs) <laughs> but a corset is actually quite comfortable to wear, provided it's not extremely tight. You can still breathe enough and move in it. And if you're making it yourself, you can get a good fit and it should be a comfortable garment. So corsetry will require you to use boning. So boning during the Renaissance period was made from animal bones. Today, the choices that we have are plastic or steel boning. I would suggest starting with plastic just because it's easy to use and it's rather forgiving to wear. The course that I made, I used the plastic boning in it. And once you understand the construction of the garment, the steel boning will be an easy transition. So essentially, you're going to have layers. You're going to have the outside fabric and interlining, which is an inner layer of material to the corset. And that has the vertical seams that the boning goes in. And then you'll have a lining. So channels are stitched along the seam lines, and then the boning is inserted. The plastic boning comes with cotton channel that you basically pull the boning out, you stitch it in, and then you stitch it into the garment either side of this channel, and then you insert the boning back into the the channel. So it's not hard to put in. It's just a straight seam that you're sewing. I discovered the seam allowances uh, for the particular corset pattern I used are only three-eighths of an inch and not the usual five-eighths of an inch. And it wasn't marked on the pattern, which is something you kind of got to watch out for. So they don't always mark things very clearly, but generally because it's a lingerie close fitting type of thing. It's a smaller seam allowance. That's just kind of standard. So I love the corset that I made. It was easy to add the grommets in the front, which are grommets are the, you know, holes that you put the ribbon through on the front. So mine laces up the front. You can also use buttonholes instead of the grommets, but I highly recommend the grommets. It'll wear much better. And I'm looking forward to making another corset soon. And I'll have another tutorial for that on the blog coming up. So as far as sewing the chemise and the skirt, again, as I said, they're easier to sew. I did cheat and add elastic to my chemise around the neck and the sleeves. It's not historically accurate, but it's easy to sew. And I don't think everyone would ever know it was there because you're seeing it from the outside of the garment, not the inside. If you're a purist, you can use a drawstring or some hand smocking but um, you can decide what works for you. I've seen a lot of different things at the fair. Unfinished hemlines are completely okay. After all, it kind of adds to the look of the peasant. It is a costume. You can take this project as far as you like or just keep it really simple. So one of the my favorite costumes that I had seen at the fair was a family that had matching outfits. It was a mom and dad and boy and a girl, and they were just so cute. The men had flannel tartan kilts with fringed hemlines, just completely simple, and then a sash to go with it. And the ladies had the long skirts out of the same fabric and bonnets, and they were just absolutely adorable. They were simple costumes, and the whole family looked so cute together. So I would highly recommend dressing the other folks in your family when you go to the fair. You can purchase costumes at the fair, but I would really encourage you to try sewing a bit of your own. I have a big inspiration board on Pinterest with Renaissance costumes. 
And you can find that link in the show notes for today, as well as specifics for, you know, the kinds of fabrics and colors and things that are popular at the fair. So I hope you enjoyed our episode today, and I'd love to see how your costumes turn out. Drop me a note. You can send an email to info at chambrayblues.com, or you can find me on the blog, chambrayblues.com, and on Facebook. We have a Facebook group. You can share your projects there as well. So that's all for today, and I hope to see you at the fair. You are listening to the Style Blues Podcast. If you have questions about this episode, you can contact us by email, info at chambrayblues.com, or visit our Chambray Blues Sewing Patterns and Tutorials Facebook page and group. Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Until next time, style those blues. Blues.